wanted to use really sure. No one would require Christian foster care and adoption services, for example, to place children in same-sex headed households in violation of their religious conscience. No one, they said, would require religiously affiliated schools and social services providers to treat same-sex partners as spouses or impose penalties or disabilities on them for their descent. No one would be fined or fired from his or her job or suffer employment discrimination for voicing support for conjugal marriage or criticizing same-sex sexual conduct and relationships. No business owner would be required to provide services for same-sex ceremonies that were contrary to his or her moral beliefs or punished if he or she declined to participate in such services. And no one, we were told, was proposing to recognize polyamorous partnerships or relationships or normalize so-called open marriages, nor would the redefinition of marriage or the expansion of marriage, as they preferred to say, undermine the norms of sexual exclusivity and monogamy and permanence in theory or in practice. Well, my very dear friends, that was then. This is now. I must say, though, that I still can't fathom why anybody believed any of it, even then. The whole argument was, and is, that the idea of marriage as the union of husband and wife lacks a rational basis and amounts to nothing more than bigotry reflecting animus against a certain group of people. Therefore, no reasonable person of goodwill, we are told, can dissent from the liberal position on sex and marriage any more than a reasonable person of goodwill could support racial segregation and subordination. You've heard the analogy drawn a thousand times. And this, we were told, is because marriage, according to the redefiners, consists principally of companionship, the companionship of people committed to mutual affection and care. Any distinctions beyond this one they condemned as baseless. Well, now, since most liberals, and even some conservatives, it seems, apparently have no understanding at all of the idea of marriage as a conjugal relationship, a one flesh union, to use the language of the Bible. Though we should note that the concept is not idiosyncratically biblical, since the very same conception of marriage as a conjugal union appears in the works of such figures as Plato, Aristotle, Musonius Rufus, Xenophanes, Plutarch, going all the way up to Gandhi. But this idea of marriage as a conjugal union, as a one flesh union, of sexually complementary spouses, they seem to reject, to have no grasp of, even enough to reject it, really. They uncritically then, not knowing what they're rejecting, not even knowing what the alternative is, conceive marriage precisely as sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership laying aside, ignoring altogether its defining social purpose, imagining somehow, I suppose, that the law has some interest in people's romantic relationships just as such. What that interest could be, none of my friends on the other side has ever managed to actually express a view about. And yet we are told marriage must be expanded or in truth redefined or perhaps in greater truth 
abolished and replaced with a conception of, quote, marriage, unquote, as sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership because they can't fathom how any reasonable person of goodwill could understand it in any other way.